Okay, hi everyone. Um, let's get started. So last time we were studying uh, encryption schemes, right? So uh, we have looked at El Gamal, we have looked at RSA and so on. So the question is, uh, what's next, right? So many people think of encryption as like, once you encrypt a message, uh, it's like a black box, right? There's nothing intelligent that you can do on the encrypted message. So that's not true at all. And uh, one of the least unexpected, one of the least expected attacks are so-called mauling attacks or tampering attacks. And even if you don't have the secret key to an encryption scheme, even if you cannot decrypt the message, there are still some very intelligent, uh, maybe adversarially successful operations uh, which you can run on encryption schemes. And let me start with an example of uh, one time pad, right? We always think of one time pad as sort of a secure encryption scheme, but there are some un unexpected things which you can do. Uh, so as an example, so let's say, let's say we have Alice and we have Bob. Okay, and let's say, let's say Bob is a stockbroker and Alice is a client. Okay, and uh, Alice wants to send some instructions to Bob, uh, maybe sell some stock or something like that. So the message which Alice wants to send is, is let's say, sell some stock, let's say Apple. Okay, and Alice and Bob, they share a secret key K and they are using a one-time pad. Okay, and then we have the adversary, let's call the adversary Trudy. Adversary is sitting over the channel, watching all communication and adversary can actually tamper with every message, right? Trudy doesn't like Alice very much. So Trudy would like Alice to lose a lot of money, right? So the goal here, which, which uh, let's say Trudy has is if the instruction is sell, let's say Apple, then it should be converted to buy Apple. And if it is buy, it should be converted to sell. Okay, so just the opposite of what Alice wants to do. And of course, Trudy has no idea what the secret key is, right? And they are using one time pad. So is this possible in one time pad? Any ideas and why? How can you do this? Just XOR, buy Apple and sell Apple. Yeah, exactly. So in one time pad, uh, Let's say I take the ciphertext. And by the way, as we define one time pad was for binary strings, but you can define one time pad even for larger alphabets. Okay. So what is C XR cell Apple XR by Apple, right? So let's call the ciphertext C prime. And now my claim is that uh, if C was sell, C prime would be buy and vice versa, right? Because if, if C was, let's say, K X or let's say sell Apple, okay? Then what we have is that sell and sell will cancel out and you would be left with K X or buy Apple, which is exactly the encryption of uh, buy. And similarly, if here we had buy, then buy and buy will cancel out and you will be left with sell, right? So you can just sort of flip this message in a very interesting way without having any information about the key. And these are known as mauling attacks. Mauling and or very naturally you can call them 
tampering attacks. Okay. <clears throat> And by the way, one time pad is not the only scheme which suffers from these kind of things. Uh, there's also Algamal. So what is the problem in Algamal? In Algamal, there's a different kind of tampering which you can do. So, so again, so let's say, uh, let's say we are using public key encryption. So there's, there's no shared key anymore. And maybe Alice and Bob and Alice is sending some encrypted message to, to Bob, right? And using the Algamal crypto system. And here, uh, maybe let's assume auctions. Okay. So let's say, Bob is, is a seller. Bob is selling a phone or, or something like that, right? Alice would like to bid, uh, let's say $100. And uh, there are many other in people interested in the phone. So there's Trudy, who is also interested in the phone. And this is a closed auction, right? So, so just to, 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 make, uh, to uh, keep the security of the auction process, uh, everybody is encrypting their bids and sending it to, to Bob. Right. Goal of Trudy is, of course, to win the auction without any kind of overpayment. So Trudy would like to bid just something slightly higher than Alice and just win the auction. And this would, of course, compromise sort of the security of the whole auctions process. And Trudy can do that very easily. So, so let's say the ciphertext of Alice is g to the power r and m times g to the power a r. And here the public key is g to the power a, right? So in Algamal, you generate uh, g to the power r and then your message, uh, then the way you encrypt it is message times g to the power a r. What Bob can, what Trudy can do is, Trudy can compute another ciphertext, even though Trudy cannot decrypt and recover the message m, Trudy can prepare a ciphertext, which is g to the power r. And let's say, 101 divided by 100 times m times g to the power a r. Or for simplicity, maybe let's just say twice of the message. Okay, and then Trudy wins the auction, of course. Uh, and uh, Trudy's bid is highly correlated with Alice's bid, even if uh, Trudy cannot decrypt the message. Right? So these are all sort of unexpected problems. If you think of encryption as a black box, maybe these things look kind of strange to you that something like this can be done. But in fact, almost all the encryption schemes in practice suffer from these kind of attacks. In RSA, you have a similar attack and so on. Right? Preventing these kind of attacks is not that easy. So what we would like is we would like to design a solution to prevent any kind of tampering or mauling of the ciphertext or the message, right? So, so we have two kind of, uh, we have sort of two high level goals in cryptography. First is protecting confidentiality and uh, second is uh, protecting integrity. And typically we treat these two things as separate from each other. There's no reason to mix the two. Let's study, we already studied confidentiality. Uh, we studied encryption, let's study uh, uh, integrity separately. And if you need both, you will just use both of these primitives. Okay, so probably the simplest uh, uh, sort of uh, cryptographic primitive which uh, allows you to deal with integrity is a message authentication code. And then in the next class, we will also study digital signatures. So message authentication code. Or just maths for short.
so so here alice and bob they have a shared secret key k this is different from uh, digital signatures and uh, uh, they would like to communicate a message such that the message cannot be tampered with if trudy is sitting on the channel tampers with the message then uh, the recipient can detect and can reject the message okay uh, so so let's look at the definition of max so any max scheme consists of three ppt algorithms algorithm 1 is called the key generation which takes the security parameter as input and outputs a shared key k okay and the sender and the receiver will will store this key the second algorithm is the mac algorithm which takes as input the key and the desired message as input and it outputs a map we will denote it by sigma and then the last algorithm is is known as the verify algorithm or the verification algorithm takes as input the key the message and sigma okay so observe that it takes both the message as well as sigma and then it simply outputs a bit output 0/1 slash 0 means uh, reject 1 means accept and essentially reject means that the message was tampered in transit uh, accept means that everything is fine okay and uh, again there are uh, two properties which you need to satisfy the first property is correctness which just says that you know if there was no tampering then the verification algorithm must always accept so correctness is the following probability that verify of k m and sigma is 1 such that k is the output of key generation and sigma is a valid output of the mac algorithm so this probability should just be one and this should hold for every message right so this is of course natural and then how do we define the security of this uh, of uh, this primitive so intuitively what we would like is the following our adversary is able to see uh, the mac on several different messages potentially even chosen by the adversary even then the adversary should not be able to come up with a valid mac on a new message and the way we formalize it is as follows we ask for the following so we say that <coughs> so the security is called unforgeability and we say the following for every ppt adversary a okay the probability of a winning the forging game is negligible 
And what is the forging game? Intuitively, adversary asks for max on several different messages and adversary wins the game if it is able to output a valid map on a new message. Okay, so forging game has, let me just write it as a game between a challenger and the adversary. So challenger and A do the following. As the first step, C samples a Mac key using the key generation algorithm. C keeps the key secret. The second stage is known as the learning stage. So in this case, adversary A sends a message MI to C, okay? C responds back or C sends uh, sigma I, which is computed as the Mac of K comma MI. Okay, and this step is repeated for some polynomial number of times. And then in the end, which is a step known as the guess step, adversary is supposed to output M and Sigma. Okay. We say that adversary has won the game. Adversary wins if for all I, M is not equal to MI and yet the verify algorithm accepts. KM Sigma is one. Okay, and the probability of any PPD adversary winning this game must be negligible. Any questions? So by the way, we will look at digital signatures in the next class, but very briefly, the difference between the digital signature and the MAC algorithm is this verification procedure. In digital signature, there's a public key using which anybody can verify the signature. Here you need the secret key, K, to verify. So the key for, in some sense, signing and verification is the same in message authentication codes. So now let's try to build message authentication codes. So very simple construction. So we will essentially show that a pseudo random function is already a message authentication code. So let's try to recall what pseudo random functions were. So in pseudo random function, again, there's a secret key uh, using which you can compute the PRF output on any message. We were calling the message an index for pseudo random functions. And the key property of a pseudo random function is even given the output of the PRF on several different messages, which you can choose, you are an adversary, uh, still the output of the PRF on a new message looks indistinguishable from random to you. This in particular also means that, you know, if you cannot distinguish it from random, then for sure you cannot produce it on your own. Producing it would be the same as like, guessing a long random string, which you can only do with negligible probability. 
So let's see this in more detail. <clears throat> so building Mac, uh, we will try to use a PRF. So here is the key generation algorithm. Um, run uh, <clears throat> key generation for the given PRF. Let's denote this PRF by F and output uh, the key K. Even in PRFs, we had an algorithm to generate the secret or the seed in that case. I hope it is visible. If it is not, then uh, let me know. I can use a different marker. <clears throat> so how does the MAC algorithm work? Takes the key and the message and sigma is just F of K comma M. It's very simple. You just evaluate the PRF on the given message. How do you verify? KM Sigma output one if Sigma equals F of K comma M and zero otherwise. Okay, you have the, the verification algorithm has the key, has the message, so it can evaluate the PRF. The correctness is straightforward. So let's just uh, discuss about unforgeability a little bit. Okay, so how do we prove unforgeability? This almost directly follows from uh, the definition of the PRF. So in PRF, we had uh, a similar game. Uh, it was called the guessing game in case of PRF. And the idea was that the adversary is given access to the PRF. Adversary can query the PRF on several different messages. And uh, uh, <clears throat> After that, the adversary sort of has to guess if it is interacting with the PRF or if it is interacting with the random function. And the key observation is that if you were indeed using a random function, then just directly it follows that uh, the probability that you can produce the output on a new message is negligible because that would be equivalent to guessing a purely uniform random string, which can only be done with negligible probability. So anyway, let's try to prove it by contradiction. So say a PPT adversary A can win the forging game with noticeable probability, okay? So first, here's claim one. So let's just see what happens in the game. In other words, a queries the challenger with several messages, let's call them M1 to M Q of N, gets max M sigma one to sigma Q of N, 
and produces m comma sigma which passes the verification test with noticeable probability now here is a simple claim if c answers queries of a using a random function as opposed to using a prf a wins only with negligible probability okay proof of this claim is is uh, in this case the output of the random function let's call it rf of uh, no key here rf of m is independent of rf of m1 up to rf of m qn if for all i m is different from mi okay <clears throat> so then assuming that the output is long enough output is basically a random string which is uniform and independent of everything which that was we have seen so far and in that case the probability that that was we can guess it is essentially negligible so this is fine and now we can already observe that the adversary a uh, fails if you are using a random function but succeeds if you are using a prf and then in some sense this adversary a already sort of distinguishing between a random function and a prf so then we will build an adversary b to distinguish a random function from a prf and how does b work b invokes the adversary a if a queries with some message mi then note that b is now interacting with the challenger of the prf game b forwards to the challenger and gets either the random function on mi or prf of k comma mi now if after all the queries are finished if a succeeds um if a succeeds then it must be the case that we are interacting with a prf b outputs a pr outputs prf as the guess else 
we outputs a random bit as the guess okay and remember that in the in the prf game you only have to succeed with probability just slightly better than half so here in this case b succeeds with probability half in this case b succeeds with probability almost close to 1 so overall b is succeeding with probability better than half assuming that this case happens with with no disable probability and this is essentially the end of our proof Sir, but okay, how does a a knows that it succeeded? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. Again, by querying the challenger. But the challenger can give you random output also, right? Then how will you know? So, yeah, let me write it here. Finally, a outputs. M comma sigma then v sends m to the challenger and sees if the response is sigma okay if so if so then a has succeeded right and in that case uh, i raised it but in that case basically uh, if so the guess of b is pr Okay, and the idea is that, yeah, the idea is that, of course, if the challenger was using a random function, then the probability that A succeeds is very little, right? So if you see A succeeding, then it means that challenger was not using a random function; challenger was using a PRF. And if if uh, A doesn't succeed, we have no idea what is happening. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. any other questions so by the way one of the things i forgot to to mention is <clears throat> even if you are using a mac there's always a, a possibility of replay attacks right so as an example <clears throat> we have alice and bob and let's say bob is a soldier okay and every day alice sends a message which is either attack or defend and they don't want enemy to change the command they don't want enemy to change attack to defend or vice versa so the idea here is they will share a secret key and then they will send the message and a map on the message so is this a good idea i mean potentially you can imagine that mac will guarantee that uh, you cannot change the message right so any problems like, with this like after two messages you can find out whether it what was attack what was defend and you can use that mac code and change yeah. the output yeah so mac basically just guarantees that you cannot change it to a new message right 
but you can always uh, replace uh, some message with an older message because you already have a valid map on the older message, right? So if you just send this command attack slash defend, then basically after a couple of days, the system is completely insecure. I can just, uh, uh, as an adversary, I can just replay the old map. So what would be the solution here? So people are talking about, can't you just append some randomness in the message and nonce in the message? Yeah, that's a good idea, except that now you have to keep track of the randomness and, and the nonce. So Alice and Bob, they have to maintain a list of all the random strings that have been used so far. And you have to make sure that uh, uh, if the same string, if the same random string is being <clears throat> used once again, then, then Bob must reject. That's one option. Maybe a cleaner option here is uh, that you append the date with the message. Assuming that you only send a single message uh, every day, just uh, appending the date is like appending a counter, which will never be reused. Or you can append the date and the exact time. <clears throat> so replay attacks are notoriously harder to, uh, to sort of take care of. Uh, many crypto protocols, which were designed, they were deployed in practice for several years. And at some point, a replay attack was found. Because it's a large protocol with several messages, you can imagine that it's kind of hard to imagine, uh, you know, <clears throat> Uh, there's also an attack where, for example, a MAC from the first round can be used in the MAC in the third round and so on. So you have to be very careful against these type of attacks. <clears throat> okay, good. So now let's move on to our next primitive, which is a collision resistant hash function. or CRHF for short. And collision resistant hash functions are <clears throat> very relevant to the study of, uh, of uh, Macs and digital signatures because uh, <clears throat> sometimes they can be used to compress the message and then you only Mac or you only sign the smaller message. And we will see that in more detail in the next class. So let's first recall what are hash functions. So I'm sure that all of us have seen some kind of hash function, maybe not cryptographic hash function, but for example, uh, many of us might have seen universal hash functions. There's universal hash function, there's pairwise independent hash functions, there's one way functions. So the variance for hash functions is essentially, I don't know, like dozens of, of different properties. So universal hash functions So typically when you define a hash function you define a family of hash functions So you'll say that h is a family of universal hash functions If for every x not equal to y in the domain of inputs, probability of hx being equal to hy such that h is sampled from this family. must be less than or equal to one by size of the range where h goes from the domain to the range. What this is saying is for any two inputs x and y, you pick a hash function at random and 
uh, a good property of a hash function is that uh, they are unlikely to collide the outputs. Right? The outputs uh, should be different. Uh, of course, there's always a probability of collision if the range is very small. Then, so this is basically the best that you can do. And uh, these type of hash functions are very useful in, for example, uh, searching. So let's say I have a bunch of elements um, which I want to arrange in a hash table, right? So what I, I would do is uh, the position in which I will store an element in the hash table will be determined by the output of the hash on that uh, string. Okay, so if the, if the hash function, for example, on X gives me, let's say, uh, let's say 500. Okay, then uh, X will be stored in the 500 bu bucket. And this makes searching almost linear time because let's say I get some element which I need to look up in the table. I can just uh, hash the element and I can see the, the exact position of that element. And I can just directly go to the position and I can retrieve it. So that's why universal hash functions are, are very useful. But here observe the following, that <clears throat> uh, this property only holds if H is chosen uniformly after X and Y. Okay, in particular, if you are given H might be easy to find x not equal to y such that h of x is still equal to h of y. Okay, this is entirely possible. Um, universal hash functions don't guarantee anything in this case. So on the other hand, cryptographic hash functions uh, which are collision resistant hash functions, they still guarantee in some sense collision resistance in this case. And by the way, this might hold if the size of the range is smaller than the size of the domain. So if the size of the range is smaller then of course there exist many collisions and you might be able to actually compute a collision. <clears throat> so instead, we would like to study um, a collision resistant hash function family. And these type of hash functions require some sort of cryptography. Universal hash functions are very easy to design, like you might have seen, seen linear constructions, like um, if, if x is the input, then the output of the hash function is basically ax plus b. And there, finding a collision might be a matter of just solving a linear equation. Okay, so let's look at uh, the CRHF family. <clears throat> so a family, let's call this family capital H. So it has many functions, HI, and uh, each function might have a domain, might have a range. More often than not, the domain and the range will be the same for every member of the family. And there's some I in capital I. Think of capital I as some large uh, set. So this is a CRHF. family if the following properties hold. Okay, and we will have four different properties here. Property one is that hash function from this family should be easy to sample. You can sample this in, in, in PPT. So there exists a PPT algorithm gen such that uh, 
it outputs uh, some H I and I, where H I is a member of H and I is in capital I. Second property is that every hash function must be polynomial time, of course. Okay, so for all x in the domain di, hi of x runs in polynomial time. The third property is the compression property. which means that for every i, the size of the domain must be larger than the size of the range, right? And then the last, and of course, the most interesting property is collision resistance. It says the following for every PPT adversary A, the probability that A gets as input a randomly chosen hash function can run on it for polynomial amount of time and then probability that A is able to output a collision must be negligible. So probability that HI of X equals HI of Y where HI and I are coming from the key generation algorithm. And then X comma Y is produced by the adversary who is given I and HI. And finally, X is not equal to y and x and y are in the domain of the hash function. This must be equal to negligible in the security parameter. Sir, I don't understand one thing that like, if the adversary is given a child itself, then how is this definition different from the universal hash function. And in that definition, you said that we can find X and Y such that H of X equal to H of Y. In the definition of universal hash functions, uh, the adversary is not given H. In fact, you choose X and Y first, and then you choose the hash function. So X and Y don't depend on the hash function. Okay, thank you, sir. thank you, thank you very much. So if for every, so you pick a fixed pair, X comma Y, and then you pick the hash function. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's look at a couple of facts. Okay, maybe let's let's do some basic sanity check on this uh, on this definition. So why is this property three compressing? Uh, why did we put it here? What if I take this property out, and let's say we are only left with property one, two, and four? Is this still sort of an interesting definition in that case, or does it become trivial? So suppose domain is actually equal to the range and I just need this collision resistance property. Oh, there can just be no collisions. It can be like a one-to-one -one map. Yeah. So if you take out this, uh, this third property, then basically an identity function is a good collision resistant hash function. Yeah. On the other hand, if the domain is indeed larger than the range, then just by the pigeonhole principle, collisions do exist. 
right? There must exist <clears throat> two different inputs which map to the same output. And then the game becomes somewhat interesting. Even though collisions might exist, we still want adversary not to be able to find these collisions. And that's where, in some sense, crypto comes in. Is n related to the size of the range? Yeah, n is related to the size of the domain as well as the range, and even uh, the number of, uh, uh, even the size of the family might depend on n. Okay, so let's uh, see here a couple of facts. So fact one is, So no single edge can be a collision resistant hash function. Okay, why? <clears throat> why did we bother talking about a family and picking at random from this family? <clears throat> why, why can't I give you a single hash function and tell you, hey, this is a collision resistant hash function, just go ahead and use it. Just hard coding the collisions. Yeah, good. So suppose I give you a single hash function, right? The size of the domain is bigger than the size of the range. That means collisions do exist, right? So in that case, uh, uh, for a single edge, There always, uh, there of course exists a PPT adversary A which may have X and Y hard coded or just built in in its code. And this is a very common point of point of confusion, right? So, so many people ask the question, uh, you know, the adversary A is supposed to run in polynomial time, and maybe if the collisions are hard to find, how can the adversary even have this hard coded, right? But here the point is that we don't care how you come up with this adversary, right? As long as the adversary can run in polynomial time, this is a valid adversary, right? And here we are not talking about how to construct A, I'm just claiming that there always exists A, which is of course probabilistic polynomial time and A would just have these X and Y return in its code. So this A does run in polynomial time and is able to produce collisions. Okay, does this make sense? Now, let's look at another fact. So earlier we studied one-way functions. And here we don't need anything like one-wayness or something like that. In fact, as I said, if I remove this compression property, it just becomes trivial. An identity function is a good uh, collision resistant hash function. Right, But it turns out that uh, CRHFs and one-way functions, they are actually intricately related. In fact, any good CRHF is also a one-way function. So <clears throat> the second fact is sufficiently compressing uh, CRHFs are also one-way functions. Sorry, just give me a second. My phone is just buzzing nonstop. Need to put it on silent. Okay. 
Okay, and what do we mean by sufficiently compressing uh, CRHFs? The size of the range must be much smaller than the size of the domain, right? So let's say your input is like two n bits and your output is n bits, then uh, you are compressing by a factor of two, and I would call that to be a sufficiently compressing compressing CRHF. And this is this this fact is is not that straightforward to see. It takes a, a couple of minutes. So suppose, uh, say, for all i, um, let's say the size of the input, and I'm not talking about, by the way, the size of the domain or the range. Say size of input equals, let's say, two times the size of output. Okay, and for, for simplicity, let's say, in other words, for all i, di is, let's say, equal to Two to the power two n and okay, size of the domain is two to the power two n, size of the range is two to the power n. So observe something here. Even though it might look like the domain is like the twice of the range or something like that, actually here the domain is exponentially larger than the size of the range. So domain is something like this. Domain is two to the power n times two to the power n. And range is like really small, two to the power n. And there are collisions everywhere, basically. So what is the idea? How do we prove this, uh, this second fact? Suppose the function is not one way, can we hope to find a collision? So if the adversary can output uh, x complement uh, x bar that also maps, then that will be a collision, right? What is uh, x complement x like, bar? Uh, so like if adversary is able to invert uh, f, like we assume that there's a exist an adversity for the one way function f and then it when you given uh, f of x it inverts the f of x and gives you x then that is a collision right yeah i, I guess maybe what you're saying is the following so, so suppose there are like several inputs which map to the same output let's say even two inputs which map to the same output so you start with one of them then you compute the output and then you apply the adversity of the one way function on that Right. Then what is the probability that you would get the first input versus the second input? So it doesn't matter which input you started with, right? Uh, the adversary only gets to see the output and will give you any one of the valid inputs. What is the probability that it's exactly the input that you started with? It's at most half. Right? In fact, if there are more collisions, it might even be much smaller than half. Okay. So if the adversary gives you a different input compared to the one that you started with, then great. You already obtained a collision. Yeah, so in this example, very roughly for each output, there are two to the power n inputs to choose from. But note that that doesn't hold for every output. That's just the average, right? Maybe some output only has a single input, but then, you know, there's a bunch of uh, inputs more than two to the power n inputs, which are going to the same output. Okay, but uh, just because uh, the, the collisions are so high, uh, the probability that you end up with an output uh, which uh, has multiple pre-images is, is actually very reasonable. And uh, the probability of obtaining a collision has, has to be just noticeable to obtain a contradiction. 
right? So let me not uh, do the entire proof because uh, I need to move to the construction as well. But uh, basically the idea is that uh, <clears throat> uh, you are given a PPT adversary A, to invert the function hi, then what you do is b works as follows. You pick uh, x at random from the range, then run a on f of x and then we will have we just need to do the following probability that a returns x prime not equal to x such that f of x prime equals f of x, this probability is noticeable. That's the last step which you have to prove. And again, we will just rely on the fact that because there are collisions everywhere, the probability that uh, x is equal to x prime cannot be very close to one. Okay, any questions? So now let's talk about constructing a collision resistant hash function. So we will just use the discrete log assumption. We don't need anything fancy like DDH or CDH. So we will build CRHFs from the discrete log assumption. And first we will build CRHFs which uh, roughly compress the input to, to uh, half or by a factor of two. So again, we will consider uh, a group capital G, a generator small g, such that order of G equals Q. Okay, and note that, uh, what is the size of the group element? equal to actually log P. Okay, going back to the Sophie Germain uh, construction. So remember that in Sophie Germain construction, this, uh, this group G was just uh, X square, where, sorry, X square mod P. where uh, x is from zp star and p equals 2q plus 1. Okay, but p and q, they are roughly the same size. Just uh, uh, <clears throat> maybe p is just one bit longer than q. Okay, so now how does the hash function work? And your security parameter in this case is like either P or Q, or you can use Q here. So 
So you sample H at random from the group such that H is equal to some G to the power R. Okay, and R will be in ZQ. Your hash function is just uh, just this H. Okay, and how do you compute this hash function? So the hash function takes as input x0 concatenation x1 where x0 and x1 are both in zq and then what you do is you output g to the power x0 times h to the power x1 Okay, and this is an element of the group. So, So what is the size of the input? They are both coming from ZQ, so it's two times log Q. And then the output size is log P. And log P and log Q, they are roughly the same. Just uh, plus one, that's it. So the compression factor is almost two here. And that's it, that's the description of the hash function. So why is this collision resistant? Okay, so, so maybe let's look at the definition of uh, the CRHF here. And I'll try to convince you that everything except the collision resistance property obviously holds. So the first property requires that you should be able to sample the hash function. And this of course is true, sampling the hash function is just sampling a random element from the group. The hash function does run in polynomial time. You just need uh, two model exponentiations here. And uh, the hash function is compressing. As I said, uh, it's compression factor is like, like two. And then finally, you just need to prove this property. That uh, finding any collision is very hard. And my idea would be uh, to prove that if an adversary uh, can find a collision, adversary can actually compute the discrete log of H. So in other words, adversary can compute R. Okay, so claim is this is a valid collision resistant hash function family. So again, we will prove it by contradiction. So suppose your adversary, suppose PPT adversary A given H, let's say the adversary can output uh, X0 and X1 such that, uh, okay, so I'm mixing up the notation here because I'm using H for the group element as well as for the function. So let me just denote it by 
eval. The evaluation of the hash function. Oh, or let me just denote it by capital H. Right. Such that capital, <coughs> oh, sorry, not X0 and X1, but rather an output uh, X0, X1, not equal to X0 prime, x1 prime such that hash of x0, x1 is equal to hash of x0 prime, x1 prime. So we will build another PPT B to solve the discrete log problem. Okay, so B takes as input uh, B takes as input some G, some H, sorry, where h equals g to the power r. And the goal of b would be to compute r by using the adversary a. So what does b do? It's very simple, b invokes a on h and a hopefully returns x0, x1 is not equal to x0 prime and x1 prime such that the hash outputs must be the same, which means that g to the power uh, x0 times h to the power x1 equals g to the power x0 prime times h to the power x1 prime. <clears throat> right? So now you have these two pair of inputs uh, with this special property. So what this means is g of x0 plus R x1 equals g of x0 prime plus R x1 prime. Okay, because uh, h equals g to the power r, which also means that x0 plus R x1 equals x0 prime plus r x1 prime mod q. Okay, q is the order of the group, so exponent is always computed mod q. Now let's just try to solve for r. We have x0, x1, x0 prime, and x1 prime. This means that R of X1 minus X1 prime equals X0 prime minus X0. Which means, again, everything is mod Q which means R equals X0 prime minus X0 divided by X1 minus X1 prime. Now, we are almost done, but not quite. And why?
Sir, is division like this allowed in modular arithmetic? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, this is just the inverse of uh, x1 minus x1 prime mod q, and remember q is a prime. So if q is a prime, then every element uh, has an inverse. So I can write it as multiplication uh, raised to the power minus one. So what is the remaining step here? It can be a division by zero, like x1 prime and x1. Yeah, that's great, right? So we didn't even use the fact that uh, these two, two numbers are different, okay? So now we need to prove a different claim, which is that x1 is actually not equal to x1 prime mod q, okay? But this equation by itself doesn't give you that. This equation just tells you that either x0 and x0 prime are different or x1 and x1 prime are different, right? But we do need x1 and x1 prime to be different. So how do we conclude this? So since there are like two risks per n collisions, then like the adversary outputting the same thing is very one by two risks per n, like not two risks per n, two risks per q probability. No, the adversary just gives you two collisions, right? And but like, can choose which they, two will be, they will be different, right? Like it has to be the exact same string, right? Like in the second half. Okay, so adversary is, uh, is a PPD adversary. This adversary, the only guarantee that you have about this adversary is that it gives you one collision. And maybe the adversary carefully chooses the collision to make sure that B fails. So even though there might exist many other collisions, we don't have access to those collisions in the following way. Okay, so the proof of this claim is actually very simple. In fact, when the adversary outputs this collision, it, it must be the case that uh, uh, actually x0 is different from x0 prime and x1 is, is different from x1 prime. Even if one of them is the same, then basically other one must be the same as well. Okay, so proof is, we'll prove it by contradiction. So suppose, suppose this is equal to this. And now let's look at this equation. So we'll not go all the way to, to, to the division yet. We will stick to this equation, right? So here now we have the fact that this is actually equal to this, which implies that x0 is actually equal to x0 prime mod q, which means that uh, actually the two, two inputs are identical. Okay, and note that uh, ZQ is the domain here. Sorry, ZQ star. So did I put star? No. Okay, any other questions? So I have one small question that every time if I want to write like use a collision resistance hash function to ensure the security, every time I'll have to sample the smallest, right? E, what do you mean every time? Like whenever I want to like hash it. I mean, you can sample it once and then you can hash it any number of times. You don't no, have to like, keep changing your hash function. 
because once you sample the hash function assuming that everything else which you do after that fact uh is polynomial time and we believe that our universe is polynomial time then uh, probability that at any point anybody will stumble upon a collision is is negligible okay so this is ensured that the like the small h that i generated will be private to me smallest uh, sorry say that again the the small h that i generated to sample the hash function it will be private to me like small that r. is what you mean yeah yeah in fact uh, you don't even need to generate the small r you can just sample a random element h and uh, you can throw away r because okay. it's not required for the operation of the hash function okay okay so evaluation of the hash function never needs uh, the small r so basically like the additional security of the cryptographic function is coming because like we are taking one random element from the family and since the adversary does not know which element we have taken that's why like it is impossible for them to a uh, hard code the collision in their uh like i mean essentially uh, the reason you need to pick a random element is because you are relying on the discrete log assumption right and the discrete log assumption says that solving a discrete log is hard only if you choose the element at random but you have, if you have a fixed element then maybe adversary already has the discrete log of that so then it's not a contradiction so you just need to pick an element whose discrete log is sort of unknown thank you thank you thank you okay so just just uh, maybe a couple of final comments is um <clears throat> we constructed one way functions from uh, from just factoring and uh, we didn't use discrete law problem so the question is suppose i give you a one way function can you construct a collision resistant hash function from that and the answer to that question is still an open problem so suppose i give you a one way function without making any additional assumptions generically can you convert it into a collision resistant hash function so this is uh, like a 30 40 year old open problem in cryptography and uh, uh, you know people believe that the answer is negative so you do need you do need some extra stronger assumptions for uh, uh, for collision resistant hash function on the other hand given collision resistant hash functions building a one way function is easy as we have already seen in this class another question is we build hash functions with a compression factor of uh, like close to 2 what if i want to compress my input a little bit more so it turns out that uh, you can essentially use the same technique and uh, this will be a problem on the on the homework you will need to generalize this construction to sort of any arbitrary compression uh, ratio Okay, so we will stop here. Next time we will see digital signatures, and we will see a very nice application of collision-resistant hash functions.